my truck just gets nailed by an IED. Next thing I know, like, like I wake up in the middle of this big firefight and like I run out of the back of the truck and <laughs> one of our squad leaders, Livingston, he's looking at me, he's like, are you okay? You don't seem okay, are you okay? When Shane Shelton had to delay his entry into the special forces to go and fight in Afghanistan, the only thing that buffered his disappointment was that he would get the chance to fight. He had joined the army with an eye on putting his physical prowess to good use. But as he would come to find out, being in top physical condition is secondary once the shooting starts. Keeping a cool head and believing in your mission and your battle buddies, especially when things get bleak, requires the kind of mental toughness that you can only perfect once the bullets start flying. It sounded like he was shooting when I looked over, he was holding his neck, falling down to the ground, and he just fell in the mud. And then Sergeant Stalker, my squad leader, was able to get a hand on him, tried to drag him into a room, and he got shot in the leg. So just chaos ensues. What is true bravery? What makes a hero a hero? Tested by the worries of what's happening at home, thousands of miles away, and the reality of what you're facing here and now. When your life is in danger every second, and it's either kill or be killed. From Wondery and Incongruity Media, this is Anthony Russo, and this is war. Sometimes an idea pops into your head and you just can't shake it. For Shane Shelton, when the notion to enlist in the U.S. Special Forces hit him, it just wouldn't relent. He was 23 years old and a little lost. Working as a personal trainer was fine enough, but he was also supplementing his income as a warehouse packer. The work was fine, but as he thought about what else he could do, where his strengths were found and where he could get the most satisfaction, the U.S. military seemed the logical choice. When I went into enlist, they wouldn't let me enlist straight into the uh, Special Forces recruitment program. You need good credit to enlist into the 18 X-ray program, which is, you know, uh, Special Forces recruitment. In the in-processing, they checked my credit and they said, oh, you know, you, you can't enlist as an 18 X-ray, but you can enlist as 11 Bravo Infantry, and you can go to uh, selection, you know, when you're uh, E-4. When you want something, you want it, even if fate seems to be sending you in a different direction. Shane threw himself into the training program, excelling through basic training and into his unit assignment. He was assigned Pashtun as a language and was preparing to head out for the Q course initial qualifications when he was turned away again. This time, because his unit was gearing up for an important mission in Afghanistan. My sergeant major decided that he needed me for the deployment. So I understand that he's the only one that could have, you know, allowed me to go to Q course. He said, no, you know, I need you on this deployment. You're going to go on this deployment. You can go to Q course afterwards. Shane's disappointment was muffled by the chance to get into combat. Sure, he wouldn't be engaging with the enemy as a member of special forces, but there was still some fighting to be done. By 2010, the drawdown in Iraq was well underway, and the fight in Afghanistan was reduced to the occasional news brief. Domestic concerns dominated the headlines, and while every military family still knew that a deployment in Afghanistan was extremely dangerous, that anxiety didn't really translate to the larger public consciousness. Shane met his wife, Stephanie, after basic training, and the two were married in October 2009 in relatively short order. His deployment came not long after. She was fine with things. I, she didn't know how tough the deployment would be. You know, she didn't know she would be pregnant soon and, and basically, you know, be pregnant with our first child throughout the entire deployment. And she didn't know what it was going to be like to have, 
you know, communications blackouts because guys in my platoon or me or, you know, uh, that we were getting hurt or we were on operations where we, you know, couldn't call home. Often for young military wives, deployment is an abstraction, not radically different from the distance between what a person thinks combat will be like versus what combat really is. Knowing that something will be difficult or dangerous, while it may make you concerned, is not the same as enduring the hardship that you only imagined. It wasn't a lot different for Shane as he prepared to give the Q course a miss. In retrospect, it makes perfect sense that the sergeant major kept him on. Shane was one of the oldest men in the unit. He was calm, intelligent, and resourceful, which was something Sergeant Major Chris Fields would confide in him years later. There was about to be a major offensive by U.S. troops in Afghanistan into an area that had long been mostly uncontested. Operation Strong Eagle would be a long, bloody push aimed at routing the Taliban of its strongholds. But the operation would come at a cost. The short version probably was that Fields didn't think he could spare one of his top guys. By the time they were on the ground, Shane had been made a team leader, although he was only an E4. Team leaders tended to be sergeants, but Shane had the leadership skills, the physical prowess, and the serious mind that would be required once the shooting started. As they pushed into the mountains of Afghanistan, though, Shane was starting to get the sense that not much would be required of him at all. So for the first, like, three or four weeks, every day we would drive out to Marawara. Talk about, like, entering a time machine. You know, we, we got there and, and all the houses are made of mud. It was just, I felt like I was 2,000 years in the past. We would pull security outside of the village city hall where, you know, our, our lieutenant and platoon sergeant would go and meet with the mayor. And it was really boring. I mean, three, four weeks into it, we had, we had not been in a firefight and I was kind of disappointed. But those conversations that they were having in there were leading up to what would be a battalion sized operation to push in past the red line and secure the area of, of Marawara, Dari Dam, and, and beyond, which, which were villages all back throughout this valley. And so we, we did that in June. We launched Operation Strong Eagle One. As the second of the 327 geared up for battle, Shane was ready. He had trained and was prepared for whatever lay ahead. The plan was to take and hold enemy territory and then take and hold some more. But as the battle day approached, Shane got some disappointing news. He would be on the common remotely operated weapons station, or crow's gun, inside the vehicle. While his buddies were outside and vulnerable, Shane would be in the relative safety of an MRAP, providing cover and support. Everyone he cared about would be on the ground except for him. It made for a sleepless night as he played every scenario over in his head, hoping that by thinking the coming battle through, he would be able to exert a little control over it, influencing the outcome remotely with his preparation as well as with his weapon. I didn't sleep all night. I ended up actually just finding some face paint, uh, you know, camo face paint. I painted my face and about, you know, I think three, maybe, you know, two, three o'clock, we started assembling as a platoon and getting ready to push out. And I remember one of the squad leaders saying, you know, they know we're coming. And I was like, what? What do you mean they know we're coming? I thought that's the whole reason we were leaving at night. Like, aren't we supposed to have the element of surprise? What do you mean they know we're coming? In retrospect, it was a sane but silly question. An operation of this size that included the Afghan army and members of the Afghan government could never have been kept a secret for long. Operation Strong Eagle 1 would be followed by several more offensives, but Shane found it surprising how much more quickly they executed it than the two subsequent Strong Eagle offenses in which he participated. What he also found surprising was the tenacity of the resistance and the genuine cost that taking each mile back from the Taliban would have on him and on his comrades. I was just trying to stay awake. As soon as we pushed, there was an IED. And I don't know if there were any survivors from that. I mean, there was probably a good like 10 to 20 Afghan National Army with us out front. And I honestly don't know if any of them made it. Like that IED went off, rounds started flying everywhere. And that's how that kicked off. As soon as that IED went off, there, you know, rounds are flying and 
you know, I'm trying to find enemy and, and like, I'm also at the same time learning what combat looks like. Uh, I hear over the radio that Sergeant Shaw is, uh, wounded. I don't know if at that point I knew he was dead or not yet. And I mean, he, he had just been with us for a few weeks. Uh, he came late on the deployment because he had just had a daughter. As soon as his daughter was born, he linked up with us. And I mean, that was just a couple of days before we went on this operation. Yeah, so I was just kind of filled with rage. And I found this guy, this 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 guy with an RPG up on the ridge line. And I asked a really dumb question. I asked my the squad leader who was in the truck with me. I said, hey, I've got eyes on a guy with an RPG. Can I shoot him? And he... Obviously, I mean, we were all pretty inexperienced. He even called on the radio to ask our platoon sergeant if I could engage. And our platoon sergeant was like, yes, effing engage. So I did. And, uh, you know, I took out that guy with the RPG. And Sometimes it takes a minute to distinguish reality, especially when it isn't a reality with which you're familiar. The time between the IED explosion, the beginning of the firefight, and Sergeant Shaw's death were mere moments, but it took that long to register just how real this combat action was. You're trained to know that lives are on the line, that you're responsible for both your buddies and yourself, and that seconds count, but until it is real to you, it's all an abstraction. If he had had his choice, Shane probably would have elected to continue his training in the States. He felt as if he would have been a valuable asset for the special forces. But as he eliminated one enemy and looked for more attackers to protect his guys from, he knew he was where he needed to be, and that there was a lot more that he needed to learn. And he would learn from it as the battle raged for the next few hours. When my Casper mattress showed up, my only concern was that my excitement over having a new bed might influence my experience. But more than six months in, I'm still as excited about how the bed is going to feel when I get in it as I did the very first week. In fact, I just gave the bed its first rotation, more because six months has passed than for any comfort reason, I just felt like it was time. You hear about Casper mattresses coming in a box, but it is truly amazing when you open the door and see this tiny box that's supposed to contain in my case, a queen-size mattress. It's still weird to look at my mattress now and think about how small the box it came in was. I'm really happy with my middle-of-the-road Casper mattress, but they have other mattresses, and as satisfied as I am, when it's time for a new mattress, I can't imagine not upgrading. Casper has lived up to all of its commitments on the bed I have, so if they say there's a next level, I'm taking them at their word. Their top-of-the-line mattress is called The Wave, the Wave features a patent-pending premium support system to mirror the natural shape of your body. Their other mattress, The Essential, has a streamlined design at a price that won't keep you up at night. You can check out all their mattresses and their prices at casper.com slash thisiswar. They're not very expensive at all, especially given that you don't have to schlep out to the mattress store, pretend to try one out, and then tie it to the roof of your car to get it home. Casper also offers a variety of other products, like pillows and sheets, to ensure an overall better sleep experience. These people take the entire process of getting a great night's sleep very seriously. Plus, all Casper mattresses are designed, developed, and assembled in the United States. I was always a little bit puzzled by the notion of Casper providing hassle-free returns if you're not completely satisfied. But I realized that if you're looking for a bed and you try this one, you're just not going to send it back. It really has made it so much easier for me to get a fantastic night's sleep. The point is, you can be sure of your purchase with Casper's 100-night risk-free sleep-on-it trial. Get $50 towards select mattresses by visiting casper.com slash thisiswar and using the code thisiswar at checkout. That's casper.com slash thisiswar, code thisiswar. Terms and conditions apply. I don't live very far from the beach. But this is the first summer in memory that I haven't been uncomfortable wearing socks. Bomba's socks are thick and substantial, and they don't make my feet hot and sweaty. In fact, they keep them cooler and drier than even when I go without socks. 
Bombas are designed to be unforgettable, not just to cover your feet, so they have to put a little bit more work in. If you're going to be on your feet all day or doing a lot of walking, Bombas Honeycomb Arch Support is a godsend. You know when you get your feet rubbed and someone just squeezes right around the arch? It's like that, but gently and all day. They genuinely make my feet feel better. Bombos was founded with the mission to donate socks to people in need. Because you can't donate used socks, socks are the most sought after items at homeless shelters. The folks at Bombos knew the only way to support their mission was by selling a lot of socks. They decided to make really good socks to get people excited about them instead of really cheap socks that people don't care about. So far, Bombas has donated more than a million socks, and they're just getting started. The Americanos, which are ankle socks that are just a half step below slippers comfort-wise, quickly are becoming my go-to style. They're simple and comfortable with all the support you need from your socks. The ankle socks and no-show socks have little grips on the heel to keep them from sliding. The calf socks have durable elastic so they don't sag. The point is, Bomba's socks are designed to stay on your feet and feel new and fresh for a very long time, even in the heat. For every pair of Bomba socks you buy, Bomba's donates one pair to someone in need. And if you purchase the Americano socks specifically, they will donate a pair to a homeless vet through their partnership with the VA. It's a super cool thing that they're doing this, especially since the socks are worth it all on their own. You can check out the Americano socks by following the link at the top of the page at bombas.com slash thisiswar. You can also save 20% by visiting bombas.com slash thisiswar. That's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash this is war and entering the offer this is war in the checkout code space. Bombas dot com slash this is war. And so he was in it now. The details of the day faded in and out as Shane tried to get a handle on the reality of combat. It wasn't just that it was messy and confusing. It wasn't that he had just asked permission to kill a man. It was that none of those things mattered. When you're in combat, fear and regret are things for later. For now, it was all about the mission. Drive the enemy from the field using whatever you have at your disposal. So in the chaos of combat, Chain tried to focus on his training. You know, everyone else was okay except my buddy Palu. He he uh, he took a couple of rounds. He took a round to the wrist and the thigh. In my mind, like we were just going to destroy these guys, and then all of a sudden, someone who I really care about is gone, and someone else who I really care about is wounded. That that hits you really, you know, really quick. Like it just, you know, something shifts, but you still have to keep fighting. You know, now, now there's even more reason to, to get into the fight. Um, the, the, the seat to my right is empty. He opens the door back there and he throws Shaw's rifle back there and he jumps in the truck and he tells the driver to just move forward. And I'm looking at the rifle. I mean, it's got blood all over it. Things are starting to, to feel really real and there's rounds going everywhere. Like there's rounds hitting our windshield you know, which is, is bulletproof. So they're not coming through, but I'm like, I'm wondering when, when are they going to start coming through? And so we just keep driving and uh, we finally get up to this, like we call it the orchard. I don't know why, like, I don't know if they were, I guess there were fruit trees, but basically it was just, it was a bunch of trees on this terrace at, at the base of the mountains. And so we're, we're next to this and I, I, I see movement. And so like I'm moving my crosshairs towards the movement and an explosion goes off and just rocks me. I look down to check and see if my legs are still there because like, I don't know what just happened, but there's this crazy explosion. We had got hit by an RPG. The truck, you know, got hit by an RPG and it immediately disabled our vehicle. And we realized there's no one else around us. Take a minute and put yourself there. You can smell the burning in the air and hear the sounds of your unit fighting off the attack, but those sounds are fading. 
They're being replaced by the steady ping of ricochets off your vehicle as you scan to see where the fire is coming from. Your ears are still ringing from the IED and, so far, you have about an hour's worth of combat experience under your belt. Alone, disabled, and under enemy fire is not a great place to be in the mountains of Afghanistan, and so you wait and watch and hope to hell you see something to shoot before it's too late. For whatever reason, we drove out 400 meters or so down the road and everyone else is still back at the initial contact point. And so like I start engaging on, on, on guys in this like orchard area, like on this terrace. Like I, I start, you know, with 50 cal, start throwing rounds down and we get hit with like three or four more RPGs. I mean, we're just sitting there, we're setting ducks and these are explosions going off in, you know, in like we're in an MRAP, like it's not that big of a vehicle. Smoke starts filling the truck and Hannah Walt, our driver, he's like, guys, do you, you, do you mind if I smoke a cigarette? And I'm like, no, like I'm thinking, no, you can't smoke a cigarette. The truck's already filling up with smoke. Like we're limited on how much time we have in here. I don't know if the truck's on fire or what, but I'm like, you get ready. Like we're going to have to get out and fight. And so, um, man, I'm just, I'm trying to engage. I run out of rounds on my 50 cal. It's a weird and interesting feature of the Crow system that while you can see and shoot the enemy from inside the vehicle, the only way to reload it is from the outside. It's an odd trade-off. Guys who've run them tend to criticize the Crow's system because it limits your vision and is no replacement for having your eyes on the enemy. It's a fair point, but after being hit by three or four RPGs, you have to wonder whether an exposed gunner still would have even been in the fight. Shane had a decision to make. A fully loaded Crow's takes 400 rounds. Filling it with ammo takes a lot longer, especially under fire, but as the firefight wore on, Shane figured the less often he had to poke his head out to reload, the better. He took a breath, opened the hatch, and went for it. Man, it just seemed like all hell was breaking loose. And so somehow I do that, I get back down in the truck, and then we get hit with another RPG and the 50 cal is disabled. And, and at this point, smoke is filling the cabin, like smoke is filling the... Uh, the truck and so i load my grenade launcher i put my my m4 on fire and like we're getting ready to bell the only problem is there's two of us facing the enemy and and then our lieutenant who would get out on the other side but like we're gonna have to get out and fight because we're not gonna be able to breathe in here maybe the truck's on fire like you know a lot of stuff had happened already you know with within the last hour or so right like i've got a bloody rifle next to me right like that's going through my head um and i'm even considering like do i need to grab that because i might need to use it and just all these thoughts going through my head well all of a sudden like just as we're getting ready to to bell a, another truck finally pulls up like our sergeant major the one who wouldn't let me go to selection <laughs> um he pulls, his truck pulls up and they start suppressive fire. They start covering us. Um, he jumps out of his truck and he, you know, like that dude was courageous. He earned all, all of my respect that day. He had no, no consideration for himself. He was just worried about us. And so we get out of the truck and, and like we're fighting, right? But we have a little support. So it was something that would happen in a movie, like right before you're, you know, you're going to perish. You know, someone, you know, someone comes in and, and rescues you. So it was, it was like perfect timing. Shane and the others were able to fight their way back to Sergeant Major Field's truck. They were by no means safe, but they were certainly less exposed. Now that he no longer was the gunner, Shane had to find another way to contribute. And as he saw the platoon commander struggling to direct air support to the targets, Shane knew another way that he could help in the fight. I'm like... Yo, Sergeant, I got it. Let me walk the Kiowas onto the, the area where we're at. And I'm looking at the map. And, and so I'm able to walk those Kiowas on and they were able to take care of the orchard. And then it was, you know, before I knew it, like things died down. Died down is a relative term. The mission was to take territory, hold it, and then take more. Once the casualties were accounted for, the unit kept pushing on but Shane and the other guys on his team had to stay with the truck until it could be recovered by support services. It's rare that vehicles are abandoned even once they've been disabled. When you're fighting an enemy that uses salvaged military weapons from a litany of invasions, it's critical to keep as much as possible out of their hands. 
While they waited to see what the orders would be and when the truck would be salvaged, the soldiers explored the orchard where they nearly had died. So we went up into that orchard and man, there was this guy with a 50 cal bullet in his chest and he was holding a pack of batteries that were taped together. And I knew what that meant. That's, that's IED detonator. And our truck was sitting right on top of an IED. Yeah. So uh, that was bizarre. And then there was a hand in a tree, like a hand that had been separated from its body, no body around, but like the hand was still holding onto the tree. And I just, it was just bizarre, right? Like this whole like chaotic mess and it all happened within a few hours. And now, now I've been exposed to combat. Now I know what combat looks like. You hear it time and again, there is no replacement for combat. You can train and push yourself beyond your boundaries, but until your life is under direct threat, until you can lean back on that training and discover that it is an aid, but also realize that your will to survive is a tool you have to use actively, there will always be a piece of the puzzle missing. With that piece in place, though, you have a totally different fighting force. Certainly, there was a sense of loss among the soldiers, but also there was a greater sense of accomplishment. They had stood firm and performed as exceptionally under fire as each soldier hoped they would. For now, though, there was nothing to do but push on, take ground, and do it again. By the end of Strong Eagle II, the U.S. had taken the Gaki Valley and was building up for what would become Strong Eagle III in the next year. As the summer faded to fall and then to winter, Shane prepared to head home on his mid-tour leave to welcome his son into the world. On a year deployment, you get 14 days, I think it is, maybe 15 days of R&R. And I got home like right before the due date. And man, like, a week went by and my wife still hadn't gone into labor. So we ended up uh, inducing labor just so I could, you know, so I could be there. And so I think three days before I was, I was slotted to go back out to Afghanistan, uh, my son was born. Man, that, that changed my world. It, it, when I got married, just having the responsibility of my wife. But now, like, I've got this little precious baby. He's so tiny and independent. But I had to say goodbye. It's a long drive to the airport and a longer wait at the gate when you're leaving your family to go back to war. For his part, Shane was resolute. This was his career and his responsibility. Over the last nine months of his deployment, he had become part of a combat-hardened fighting team with the confidence beyond what any of them would have expected before that first battle kicked off Strong Eagle 1. At every turn, though, the space between what Shane wanted for himself and what was required of him widened until he had to give in to the notion that his plans would have to wait until the mission was over. All he could do was be prepared for that moment and account for the fact that that moment might never come for him. I was walking past this little USO sign and there was something about like reading a book and recording it on DVD. And, and so I like I went in and I'm like, wait, can, can I record a DVD um, for my son? And they're like, yeah, yeah, you can pick any book. You can record you reading the book. We'll put it on DVD and, uh, you know, we'll send it home. I was like, wow, that's great. You know, because honestly, like I felt like I wasn't going to make it home. I felt like it was going to be my turn next. There's a lot more at stake. Like, it's not just me, it's not just my wife, but like now there's a baby, you know, in, in the picture and and he needs a dad and all of that's running through my head. And I read, like, I picked this book, it's Jonah in the Well. It's, it's a Bible story. As I'm reading it, I'm thinking, man, what if this is the only thing he has to remember his dad by? Like, yeah, what if, what if I never see my family again? And what if my son doesn't have a dad? It's not an easy thought to shake, and maybe you don't want to. Shane wasn't returning to Afghanistan because he was a thrill seeker. He was returning because of his commitment and his duty. He was returning because he was a soldier in wartime. It was just what he did. More important, he had learned two things very well during the first part of his tour. The first was that he was brave enough and cool enough under fire to make a difference. The second was that once the first shot was fired, you were cast out into danger and there was little you could do to affect the outcome besides give in to your training, trust the person next to you, and hold on tight. The buildup for Strong Eagle 3 was as uneventful as three months in Afghanistan possibly could be. 
And as the end of March approached, details about what would be their final mission of the tour reached the soldiers. We were going to leave in a month, go home. And then we found out we were going to borrow all the clay, which as soon as we heard that, we knew, okay, this is going to be big. I mean, that's, that's where QZR lived. Like QZR was the Taliban commander of that area. And there was a propaganda radio station there. We knew that's where he trained all of his fighters. We knew it was going to be a big fight. We were sitting on a Chinook in the middle of the night and just waiting to uh, go get dropped off at our, at our drop zone. It was raining and, and honestly, like, we're thinking that, hey, you know, this could get canceled. They could cancel this operation because there's not going to be any air support because it's, it's supposed to rain for like the next, you know, two weeks. And so I'm thinking, all right, we are going to, uh, you know, this is going to get called off. Well, my, my squad leader leans over to my ear. He's got a radio and uh, he leans over and he says, third platoon has two WIAs. And I'm thinking, wow, that had to have happened just as they landed, right? And I'm like, okay, this, this isn't getting called off. It's already started. And, and he told me, he told me, make sure you've got one in the pipe, meaning make sure you've got your, your 203 grenade launcher loaded. And so, um, yeah, so soon after that, we took off. Every person on that Chinook knew what they were going to be facing when they landed. If the WIAs, soldiers wounded in action, were already starting before the entire force even was in the air, the soldiers were in for a long battle. Worse, the rainy weather meant no air support. During Strong Eagle 1, Shane and his team had been extracted from trouble when they called for and received air support. This time they would be on their own fighting an enemy who knew they were coming and that was defending one of its most prominent positions. It would be a long, difficult battle that would affect everyone who survived it deeply. Before I joined Dollar Shave Club, I always tried to get one last shave out of my razor because they were expensive and I didn't want to have to go buy more. It's crazy how now I just expect that I'll always have a fresh razor and a clean shave. It isn't even a consideration anymore. For me, Dollar Shave Club has become the go-to for a slew of hygiene products. The razors are just a given. It started with my decision to test drive a couple of their products. The first thing I tried was the Amber Lavender Body Wash. I really just got a sample size on a whim. I figured spending the couple dollars would be worth it to know which products felt the best for me. I got one of the trial packs and I knew after one shower that I'd be ordering the body wash from now on. Increasingly, Dollar Shave Club is destroying the notion of having to treat yourself to anything when it comes to hygiene products. You just order the best stuff and you get the best stuff. In addition to razors and body wash, Dollar Shave Club has shave butter, shampoo, toothpaste, everything you need to look, feel, and smell your best. The best part for me, though, is once you find the products you like, you can just get them. They come in the mail, you order them when you need them. It's as simple as that. You don't have to set foot in a store, wandering the aisles, hunting for razors, shampoo, body wash, toothpaste, none of it. Test drive everything they have. You're definitely going to find something that you like. And here's a great way to try a bunch of Dollar Shave Club's products. For just five bucks, you can get their Daily Essentials Starter Kit. It comes with body cleanser, one wipe Charlie's, their amazing butt wipes, their famous shave butter, and their best razor, the Six Blade Executive. Keep the blades coming for a few bucks more a month and add in shampoo, toothpaste, or anything else you need. Check it all out at dollarshaveclub.com slash thisiswar. That's dollarshaveclub.com slash thisiswar. The team actually landed without incident just before dawn. Even though they hadn't taken fire on their way down, circumstances did require a change of plan. Instead of moving out under the cover of darkness, they elected to wait for the sun. The rain had been relentless and the terrain on the high mountains was difficult enough to negotiate even in the best conditions. There's no telling whether it turned out to be a good decision or not because the battle that ensued was something they were bound for pretty much since they landed in Afghanistan nearly 11 months before. This big push always was coming. 
And the rain let up, it stopped raining, and that morning we went down into Barawala Kalei. So we're going down this draw in the mountain, and on the way there, we're getting all kinds of radio chatter, like enemy radio chatter saying, okay, we see them, we're about to attack, we're going to attack right now. Like they said that over and over and over again, but they didn't attack, like for whatever reason, they hadn't attacked yet. Well, we get down into the village, like this place is the craziest place I've ever seen like anybody living. Like <laughs> there's these cliffs and there's these homes on these cliffs, like surrounding these cliffs. And uh, these are like mountain people. And so it begins. The soldiers go house by house, discovering caches of weapons from the British, the Russians, the Americans. The sky started threatening again, so Shane and two other soldiers, Switchenberg and Frapp, began filling sandbags to fortify the courtyard of the Kalat on which they had stopped. It's something of a race against the rain. Between the radio chatter and the impending storm clouds, there's a general certainty that contact is imminent. Without air support, the soldiers are at a particular disadvantage this deep in Taliban territory. Rain is the enemy's ally, and when it comes, they're emboldened it starts raining and as soon as it starts raining we take fire we run back into the like the courtyard of this little clot and like we're fighting like rounds are flying everywhere you know at this point we've been in afghanistan for 11 months and we're fighters like we we figured it out at, at this point and so i'm standing next to sergeant ski just to his left i hear what i thought was his m4 going off like i thought he was shooting like at that point, you know, he would have been like directing fires or, or something, right? For him to shoot instead of like directing his team to shoot, it was a little like I looked over because, you know, I thought maybe, okay, maybe he sees somebody, you know, immediately around us or he's got eyes on something. Um, and I look over and he's holding his neck and he had been shot in the neck. He was never firing his M4. It was just the rounds were so close to us that we were hearing the, uh, the, the supersonic blast. When I looked over, he was holding his neck, falling down to the ground, and he just fell in the mud. He had just had a little girl too. And uh, he did not make it. And then Sergeant Stalker, my squad leader, was able to get a hand on him, tried to drag him into a room, and he got shot in the leg. So <laughs> just chaos ensues. There's a big difference between being in a firefight and recounting it, but they do have at least one thing in common. Time slows down so that you can take everything in. Switchenberg was able to get Stalker to cover and patched up, but the fight continued for hours. Staff Sergeant Frank Adamski III was one of the six soldiers killed that day, the first of eight bloody days in an operation that was slated to last only 72 hours. During the tense hours when it was going the poorest and it looked as if they would be overrun, Shane worried for his survival, but never for a second doubted that he was right where he belonged. So there's a lot of loss to deal with. We all knew each other. Like, you know, we all trained together. We were all really close. So we got done with Strong Eagle 3. And a few days later, we had a memorial service at Fob Joyce. That helps bring some closure. You know, you, you, you all gather together and, and they've got their boots and their rifle and their helmet up there. And we had had a memorial service before uh, for a few, you know, but uh, it's just, it's, it's an emotional thing um, because they're heroes and, you know, that could have easily been you. You know, the, the 21 gun salute always gets me, man. I mean, you know, what, what happens is the sergeant major or the first sergeant or, or whoever's conducting it, they, they call out the names of people in the audience, like they're doing roll call, you know, like, and then they call, they call the names of the guys that aren't there standing next to you anymore. And there's silence. And then, and then there's the, the 21 gun salute. And I mean, it just, you know, you feel the weight of their absence and, uh, you know, that's that's what we did, though. You know, we we uh, we had a memorial service and we said goodbye and and then we got ready to go home. The weight of loss isn't erased by seeing your wife and son, but it certainly can help take the edge off. 
When Shane arrived back in the States, he was grateful to have made it and regretful not to have brought everyone back with him. But when he arrived back home, before he even made it into the reception hangar that had been prepared for returning soldiers, he saw a figure out on the tarmac. And Sergeant Stalker was waiting for me out on the tarmac. And he was limping because he had just been shot a month before. And he, he uh, ripped my E4 rank off and he pinned my E5 rank on. And that was special because I had to take his place when he was wounded and borrow all the clay. Like, like I went from being a team leader to a squad leader. And that was just kind of, you know, that was verification or that was kind of like him saying, you know, good job. You know, you did a good job. I hadn't I hadn't picked her out yet. Like, you know, there's a lot of people there and I hadn't seen her, but like I was anxious. Like I was, she's my wife, but at this point we'd still only been together physically, like been in the same location for like a total of like seven months at this point, you know, thinking through that. And, you know, I couldn't wait to hold my son, Ryan, my parents were going to be there. And so we got released from formation yeah, my, my whole family was right there, and, and I grabbed my son, and uh, we took a bunch of pictures that I still have. We've got them up in the house, and, and uh, yeah, I was back, so. Before he even had touched down, Shane had abandoned all thoughts of going to the Q course with an eye on becoming a member of Special Forces. Sure, there was the pride involved in completing the training and being acknowledged as among the best of the best in the popular imagination. But Shane had a particular insight that few people had when it came to the fighting force that he had served with. On that deployment, I fell in love with the conventional unit. Like, I felt like we had accomplished a lot. The reason I wanted to go there in the, in the first place is because I wanted to be a part of the best. Like, I wanted to, I wanted to strive to be with the best. And those guys are awesome. They like, don't get me wrong, but I was with the best in that unit, in my unit and uh, had been with them in Afghanistan. And, and so I made that decision to stay conventional. In my heart, I wanted to stay conventional and not go special forces. And then my wife got pregnant again with a girl, Isabella. And so, you know, I had a lot of fun over the next two years and I didn't want to get out, but at the same time, I wanted to be a dad. There's an infinite amount of space between what you want to do and what your future holds. Sometimes it seems as if fate will carry you to your destination whether or not you want to go along. Other times the route seems clearly marked with each decision you make leading effortlessly to your goal. In reality though, each decision you make is tied up in how your last decision changed your life. Although Shane Shelton had a vastly different picture for his military career, what he really had his heart set on was a life where he could pursue personal excellence. In the end, what he really sought and found was gratitude, both for the life he kept and for all of the potential that it still holds. Next time on This Is War. We were called to a, a troops in contact with a convoy. You know, I want to say maybe three Humvees. And the first two hit IEDs. And so the third one gathered as, you know, the living and as many injured as they could before they peeled out of there. But of course, they had to leave the deceased behind. Those feelings of failing and not getting to a tick in time and feeling like I let people down, like it was my fault that people died, that I couldn't protect my boys. Subscribe to This Is War on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you're listening right now. If you're listening on an iPhone, just say, hey Siri, subscribe to This Is War. For show notes and more information, simply tap or swipe over the cover art. You'll also see offers from our sponsors, Please help support our shows by supporting them. Another way you can help support This Is War is by giving us a five-star rating and review or by following This Is War on social media. And be sure to tell your friends and show them how to subscribe. Are you a combat veteran or do you know one with a story to tell? 
reach out to us at stories at thisiswar.com with your dates and branch of service and a brief description of the story you'd like to share. I'm Anthony Russo. This Is War was produced by Incongruity Media. Executive producer, Hernan Lopez for Wondery.